Okay, thank you very much, Melanie, for the kind introduction. Thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to sunny California uh, to this wonderful workshop. Thank you all for getting up early and coming to the talk. I'd like to tell you a bit about some work we've been doing on exploration in reinforcement learning, focusing on some issues related to safety and efficiency. And this is work with a wonderful set of PhD students and senior collaborators who I'll acknowledge as we go along. Now, we already have seen a bunch of talks on reinforcement learning. No surprise, right? Arguably, it's a problem of central interest to the three communities present here at that workshop. And by finally, we might have some disagreement on which words to use and which letters to use. We all somehow want to help uh, the agent to change the world and derive some reward. And of course, one of the central problems in reinforcement learning is really the exploration exploitation dilemma, right? So the need for the agent. Uh, to figure out how the world works, to experiment with different actions in order to learn about their consequences, to identify the model, and to use what it learned in order to do well. And of course, these sort of ideas have been explored over the last decades in the various different communities, and we've seen already I mean, some of the amazing accomplishments and breakthroughs over the last couple of years, so you can't give a talk about RL these days without admiring, uh, for example, most notably the landmark uh, victory of Alpha Zero in the game of Go. And we've already seen slides of that kind in earlier talks, so here's my version of that slide. Uh, I would argue that a lot of the breakthroughs we've seen in situations where we have a perfect world model. Right? The best examples are games. We know precisely how the goal board looks once we and our opponent have taken uh, a move. Right? And so that means that exploration is primarily a computational concern. It's still really, really hard because there's these massive state spaces. We have to solve really large uh, dynamic programs. Right? But we've seen in recent years how massive compute and clever algorithms can get us very far. Now, if you want to think about going to domains where we might want to use data-driven control, reinforcement learning, in things like controlling our renewable energy systems, um, precision agriculture, medical applications, scientific domains, and so on, we rarely have a perfect simulator, right? We rarely have a perfect world model. Right? That means that we actually have to learn by trying out things in the real world. Right? That means that exploration suddenly sounds like a dangerous proposition. Right? We'll have to experiment with actions uh, whose consequences are known. So safety is certainly crucial. And also the economics of it. Right? If collecting data requires experimentation, you have to be really very careful about uh, sample efficiency. And there's many, many other is issues that we've been exploring other talks related uh, to this workshop, related to partial observability, uh, difficulty in specifying rewards, right? maintaining reliable models over time, and many, many other things. Right? So I think we're sort of barely scratching the surface in some of the challenges that we need to face when uh, bringing all forward. So what I want to talk about in this uh, presentation is to talk about some ideas we've been exploring in the context of uh, safe and efficient exploration and really want to focus on uncertainty uh, as sort of one of the crucial elements uh, that um, I think we need to understand better in order to resolve these trade-offs. Okay, so let me start um, with uh, safe exploration. I'm going back uh, to, uh, to our uh, perception action loop, right? And the first question is sort of what is safety? And one natu very natural way to sort of think about safety is to have some sort of formal constraints, maybe on states we want to avoid. The problem in reinforcement learning is, of course, since we don't know the dynamics, we don't know ahead of time which actions might take us into unsafe states or take us to states from which we can't recover. Right? That's really the fundamental problem. So we basically have to solve an optimization problem, a planning problem, where some of the constraints that we have to face are unknown ahead of time. And what I want to talk about is some ideas on sort of how to address uh, these kinds of questions. Right? The real problem is that we somehow have to, we don't know what is, what is bad ahead of time. Now, of course, in order to become a bit more formal, we'll have to drill down, right? And there are sort of these general high-level approaches in RL, right? The first direction would be sort of model-based. You can try to estimate a model of our consequences, of our actions, right? Transition model rewards, and then learn and uh, sort of plan in that uh, identified model. And the other direction is sort of the more model-free variant, where we maybe take a parameterized class of policies and try to solve a global optimization problem over the set of policy parameters. And in this talk, I want to focus on ladder. We've also been doing quite a bit of work on sort of more model-based setup, using some of these ideas that I'm going to talk about, for example, to think about um, integrating them in the context of model predictive control, and I'm very happy to talk more with you later. So I want to ground some of the discussions in the real application. So this is a collaboration that we have uh, with the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. It's a large federal research center. 
and they build uh, instruments like this. So this is the free electron laser, Swiss, a Swiss file free electron laser. It's a 700 meter long linear accelerometer uh, that generates hard X-ray pulses of extremely short uh, duration, so femtosecond duration, one millionth of a billionth of a second. And why is this useful? Well, because you have these extremely short durations, you can image very, very fast processes. So you can sort of image how sort of one molecule turn, turns into another, say, in the context of a chemical reaction. Right? And these sort of things are very, very crucial from like, drug design to materials discovery and many other things. But it's also a pretty complicated machine with many literally moving parts. Right? So there's various magnets that shape properties of the beam that is being generated and so on. And also the beam properties, like the pulse energy eventually generated, uh, depend quite uh, heavily on these different settings and also different environmental conditions like humidity, uh, temperature, uh, etc. Right? And also different experiments actually have different requirements. So you might want to contextualize what you do depending on the application you have to solve. So we talked about safety, what are safety constraints? So if you're not careful, there can be beam losses. So basically there can be radiation losses, which uh, for example demagnetize some of the magnets um, and that is really bad because they have to be replaced, it's very expensive. <coughs> right? And the system has to go offline. I'm sorry, what is an undulator? Yeah, so an undulator um, is basically a sequence of magnets arranged in a slick-like pattern um, that is designed in a way to shape the beam. It doesn't matter too much for the sake of the talk. Okay, but it's basically a particular form uh, of, um, uh, of sort of magnets that are used in this, uh, in this machine. So its function is to, I is to shape yeah. the beam? Yeah, shape the beam, yeah, exactly, okay. to create this high, in, uh, high right. intensity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. So one way to sort of think about this from a very high level, right, is to have sort of a black box, which maybe is our laser, right? And what we can do is we can uh, inject uh, some parameters, um, uh, theta t, and measure how well they do, right? So measure the beam intensity to regenerate. But at the same time, what we can also do is we can measure how close we get to violate any of these constraints, right? You can look at these loss monitors and see how close we get uh, to uh, sort of critical regions, right? And now, given that sort of feedback model, what we'd like to do is to sort of try to optimize the performance. The problem, of course, is that ahead of time, F and G are unknown. And there are simulators for this sort of machine, but they're extremely, extremely slow because they have to be super, super precise. And um, also, it's very difficult to capture environmental conditions in real time and so on. So you actually have to do this experimentation live. Right? So the question is, how do you close that loop? And so as you said, right, so mathematically you can think about this as a constraint optimization problem that we want to optimize this objective, right, so the uh, pulse intensity subject to uh, the constraints. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't violate any of these constraints any single step along the T. So basically, right, we have to solve an optimization problem with unknown objective, unknown constraints, while guaranteeing feasibility every step along the way. So by now I should have convinced you that this is a completely ill post problem. Right, so without any assumptions that this is completely hopeless. So the question is, under what sort of settings does this become tractable? Can we actually think about this? Right, so let's build some intuition. So here's sort of a one-dimensional cartoon. Uh, we actually, uh, the objective and the constraints are equal. So what we want to do is we want to somehow try to maximize f um, uh, subject to ensuring that wherever we evaluate that function, we are above uh, that threshold. Okay, so now um, without any knowledge, even the first action, could be unsafe, right? So a very natural starting point would be to assume that we have some sort of safe seed from which we can explore, right? Some initial feasible iterate. Okay, so that's what we need, but the, uh, we need more, right? So if there's no other structure in the domain, there's really no hope that we can uh, proceed. So we also need some form of regularity assumptions and regularity conditions. And I'll talk more about what those are um, going forward, right? Some sort of smoothness properties. Uh, and from those, of course, ideally, you'd like to sort of find the globally optimal solution, right? In general, um, uh, so uh, that's maybe too much to ask. So the first uh, aspect here, of course, is sort of purely informational. So if we can only rely on sort of smoothness conditions, we shouldn't really expect to leave this red set here, right? So this uh, connected component of the feasible region containing our starting point. Right, because we can't predict that there are other th safe things over here. And of course, there are sort of computational limitations in high dimensions. Global optimality will not be really uh, what we can get, uh, try to get. And we'll look at sort of notions of local optimality. Okay, right, so, and, but we can sort of try to get to this reachable optimum. Okay, now the question is sort of how, what are ways of sort of capturing assumptions on regularity on these objectives? So one way to sort of go about this is to take a Bayesian point of view. 
sort of naturally to specify prior assumptions, and to basically view the objective and the constraints as realizations of a stochastic process, of a prior distribution of our functions. And that's the central idea in a field of inquiry called Bayesian optimization. So what you're going to do is you basically sort of build a probabilistic model of uh, this black box, which we can use to make not only predictions about, say, the beam intensity for things you haven't tried yet, but also to quantify the uncertainty in that sort of prediction. Okay, and now a sort of a central idea in this domain is to then use some form of index-based policy, acquisition function, surrogate objective, different names for this, that basically looks and inspects this black box and scores the different experiments, how well they are useful in navigating this exploration exploitation dilemma. And there's actually a whole range of those. Most of the work is sort of unconstrained settings. There's some work on sort of constrained uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, but uh, prior to us, um, all the work on uh, constrained Bayesian optimization uh, only sort of try to heuristically eventually encourage feasibility, but happily violate constraint along the way. And if you want to think about safety, maybe you actually want to have sort of guarantees about what the algorithm does. Okay, so. Uh, now, of course, in principle, you can use many different Bayesian models and instantiate this. So one common choice used in Bayesian optimization are Gaussian process models. So these are non-parametric statistical models that are, on one side, quite expressive in terms of what they can capture. Uh, but they're also sort of very nice computationally. Uh, so you can do closed form posterior updates. Um, and you can uh, sort of analytically understand what's going on pretty well. So uh, the theorems I'm going to tell you about relate to things like Gaussian processes. Later on, I'll show you experiments on things using like Bayesian neural networks and other kinds of Bayesian models. So the sort of cartoon idea, right, is we think about this unknown function or constraint as a realization out of infinitely many possibilities uh, drawn from the stochastic process. And being a Bayesian model, we can condition on data under which the posterior distribution will contract. Right, and Gaussian processes. In yeah. your case, even the points you're evaluating it have uncertainty, don't they? Yeah, exactly. So, so the experiments are noisy. So it's stochastic, so, so it doesn't become a point. So this is uh, deterministic observations, which is, of course, a special case. In general, this will not collapse to a point, mm -hmm. right? So this is all, everything stochastic. So maybe we should have pointed out, so the standard observation model you'll assume is stochastic is basically sub-Gaussian noise. Um, that's uh, that's uh, independent of forms of multiple different sequence and so on. Okay, and so now, as we specify Gaussian with the mean and the covariance, Gaussian processes are specified by a mean function, covariance function, which captures everything we need to know about smoothness properties, right? So this, this covariance function tells us anything about uh, the smoothness of that resulting uh, model. And now, why is this uncertainty useful? Here's sort of a crucial picture, um, right? So imagine um, we've collected some data and we're able to somehow using this model to construct these confidence estimates on the outcomes of experiments you haven't tried yet. So we believe somehow that with high probability, the true function will live somewhere within these gray uh, areas. Why is this useful? Well, we can apply the following rationale. Uh, so you can look at sort of a pessimistic estimate of our optimum, the maximum lower bound, right? And then that tells us that we can basically, if we want to look for the best solution, we really only need to look at this green region, where the upper confidence bound, the optimistic estimate, exceeds this best lower bound. Okay, that's sort of a central element that's sort of used uh, in a whole range of different domains and bandits, Bayesian optimization, and so on. So one way to operationalize this is to sort of justify um, optimism in the face of uncertainty, right? To just uh, maximize, say, uh, the upper confidence bound. That's sort of a standard technique widely used in bandits and reinforcement learning. Okay, however, if you want to think about safety, maybe being too optimistic is also not good, right? But of course, we can do similar things if you think about constraints, right? If this is now our confidence estimates of our constraints, then uh, we can use this in order to construct conservative estimates of our feasible region, right? So we can just look where does our constraint exceed the safety threshold, that's this red set, and then just constrain the experiments we carry out to a sort of this red set. Okay, that's sort of a hopefully intuitive sort of argumentation. Of course, in order to operationalize this, we have to sort of get into that position where we have these well-calibrated confidence intervals, and that itself is a pretty hard problem. So if you sort of just stick with the Bayesian setting, so we really believe that we have a prior distribution of all those functions, right? And we only care about credible intervals at one single point at the marginal, then of course, it's very easy to get basically the confidence bounds sort of in this credible intervals by just taking the mean and uh, some multiple times the standard deviation. Right, that traces all the percentiles. Okay, so the trouble, of course, is that if you want to make use of this picture in the previous slide, um, we actually have uh, to require that this holds everywhere in the picture, right? Everywhere in the domain. 
right? So and this is, of course, a, if you wish, a multiple hypothesis testing problem, right, over infinite, uh, an infinite domain, right? So it's uh, basically um, sort of you want to do a union bound over all points in the domain. Okay, and it's, uh, so, so that's sort of the first aspect. The other aspect is maybe uh, really believing that you have this prior distribution of how the world works is maybe a little bit too much to ask, right? So instead, what we'd also like to try to understand is how robust are these sort of prior assumptions with respect to nature, right? You want to figure out if we use our Bayesian algorithm, how well can we expect it to work if sort of the world, the world satisfies certain regularity assumptions? Okay, and so it turns out that one can actually do this, one can actually calibrate these confidence intervals in a way to basically really get frequentist coverage for a whole range of different functions that sort of agree with our prior. And basically what you have to do is you have to sort of trade mean and uh, uncertainty um, in a way that depends, the first term is basically a notion of complexity of the true function with respect to our model, right? So uh, you shouldn't expect uh, these sort of models to work if nature completely ignores your prior, right? If it's completely different from the model that you use, right? Clearly things shouldn't work. And the second is some notion of capacity. If you want to admit many different functions, then we'll have to basically do a union bound over sort of a more complex domain, right? And there's sort of more effective degrees of freedom. And you can quantify all of this. So this second term here is some, uh, some notion of sort of information capacity, it sort of bounds the worst case number of bits, the maximum number of bits we can, ex uh, equ uh, we can extract from this non-parametric prior if we limit it to at most t experiments. And you can think about this as basically a function that under at least sort of natural conditions grows sublinearly. You can show analytically that for certain types of kernels this grows only polylogarithmically in t. Okay, and you can also numerically calculate this efficiently using greedy algorithms. You can analyze this using techniques from some modern analysis. Very happy to tell you more about this stuff afterwards if you're interested. What do you mean by k? What is the k norm? Yeah, so the k norm. What is the k? In yeah, so the, the so the Gaussian process uses a covariance function. No, I mean you have a norm yes. on f. Okay, let me explain. So the Gaussian process uses a covariance function, yeah. which models the covariance between the responses of two pairs of yeah. points x and x prime. Okay, and so. What this norm is, is the norm in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space okay. that uses the covariance function as kernel. So it depends on the kernel. It depends on the kernel, exactly. Okay. Right? So, I mean, so, so, so the, the okay. gist of this is it Same captures thing. how well does nature agree with your prior. Yeah. Okay? Good. So what this means, uh, so, and so and also one thing is sort of a line of work on this, um, and so the most recent result is that one can actually establish these bounds even under some sort of adversarial settings, even if there's sort of worst case disturbances uh, of, of these observations. So you can even do this in sort of a you know, non-realizable setting. Happy to tell you more about uh, this later. What's most important for the rest of this talk is that there's at least some conditions that we can try to understand mathematically under which you can realize this sort of picture. Okay? So in the following, we want to build on this sort of picture. And the first sort of idea would be to say, well, let's be optimistic, but not too much, right? So let's say, be optimistic, but only consider actions that we can certify as safe, right? So we're going to use standard acquisition functions like optimistic exploration, Thompson sampling, expected improvement, whatever have you, but you restrict it to the set that's sort of conservatively estimated as safe. The problem with this is that what happens is you often get stuck in poor solutions. And here's sort of the cartoon explanation of this uh, is basically that sort of these plausible maximizers that these algorithms will sort of sewn in uh, is typically contained in the strict interior of this red set. So they have no incentive to explore this boundary over here uh, through which you could actually find a better solution um, in this part of the domain. Okay, that's sort of one issue and one ha really has to sort of think a little bit more carefully about what expiration means in this sort of setting. And so one way to fix this uh, is basically using an algorithm uh, that we call safe up. So it works as follows. So we're going to maintain confidence intervals for our objective and our constraints. We maintain this classification into points that are plausibly optimal, according to the slide I told you about before, right? Up, upper bound exceeds best lower bound, and the set of red points that we can certify safe, we'll ever only explore red points. But now we not only consider these green points, but also these purple points here. And so these are points that are pl plausible expanders. So these are points where an observation might plausibly allow us to infer additional actions uh, to be safe. 
I'll spare you the mathematical definition, but that's basically what it is. Okay, and so now what you're going to do is here, sort of among those, we kind of get the sort of the most uncertain one, most informative one, so we'll sort of keep pushing the boundary and eventually figure out that the grass is greener over here, right? And we'll find the solution on this side. Yeah? Um, can you just say something about how sensitive that um, yeah. plausible expander set is to the sort of whatever condition it you have that made it so that the left side, for example, was not, did not contain plausible expanders here? Like in this example, you only had plausible expanders on the right. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, so I mean this just, uh, and of course in the end everything boils down to sort of the, how well your model captures reality, right? Yeah, yeah. And if there's a arbitrary discrepancy, of course none of this will work, right? But, right, again, as we, it's pretty clear, right, that without any assumptions this is just a uh, problem that's hopeless in general. Oh yeah, but I just, you know, what I was trying to ask was just how sensitive, you know, are you to whatever sort of hyperparameters you put in to identify this plausible set on the boundary? Yeah, so you can actually analyze this right, using basically so what happens if you if misestimate parameters, what changes with the, uh, the norm of the function you estimate and so on. But the, uh, let me, we can talk more about that offline if okay. you're interested. Thank you. But there's ways to sort of do this sort of things. Uh, okay, uh, good. And so what one can show is that basically under these sort of conditions that one needs for these uh, confidence intervals to hold, one can prove safety and completeness, right? You can show that with high probability over the noise realization, everything else is deterministic, uh, the algorithm will never violate any of the constraints, and um, you can bound the number of samples uh, it takes uh, to find an epsilon optimal reachable point. Now that label complexity in general will be exponential, right, for things like Gaussian kernels, uh, but there's techniques of combining this with elements of local search, sort of randomly chosen subspaces and so on, uh, to get sort of uh, local convergence res um, uh, results um, uh, that are polynomial in the dimension. And I'm happy to tell you more about this if you're interested in too. Okay, so uh, now one other aspect I want to talk about is that this basic version of the algorithm uh, has slight issues. So one of the issues is that it's sort of overly sensitive to these expanders. Maybe it gets a little bit to the question that you asked. So what, what hap tends to happen empirically is that you sort of keep exploring the boundary a lot, right? Because you really figure out maybe there's something better over there, right? And so that still works well in terms of the simple regrets, sort of the suboptimality of the solution you can find, but uh, can be pretty wasteful and uh, to uh, perform poorly, uh, poorly in terms of cumulative regrets. And so one thing that we've been uh, working on and sort of uh, trying to improve on is to think about sort of more goal-directed safe exploration. So here's sort of the basic idea. So what you can do is suppose you're optimistic without any constraints and say, Reed, ideally, I'd like to explore this, this action. Now, if you can serve, certify to be safe, you just go ahead and carry out that experiment. But if it's not safe, then better maybe not try that. But you can sort of try to work your way towards it can sort of try to plan a path to collect information that would allow you to eventually get uh, to that action. Okay? And so that sort of is a more sort of goal-oriented exploration. Here's sort of what in this case happens, right? So it does explore the boundary, but eventually it figures out that actually all the optimal points are sort of in the middle because even optimistically, nothing good is to be expected out here. Okay, so here's sort of the first um, uh, proof of concept experiment on this, some experiments that, uh, that my student Felix did. Uh, and this is collaboration with Angela Schellig's group. Um, Angela is going to give a talk later this week. Um, uh, and uh, this is basically an illustration of this algorithm on a uh, simple sort of quad copter control experiment. So what you do is you take a nominal uh, first, uh, prin uh, uh, first principles models of this quad copter, uh, derive some LQR controller, but then inject some gain parameters which are tuning using this sort of methodology. And the first point is that essentially most of these parameter settings will cause the quadcopter to go unstable and crash against the wall. So if you just apply standard optimistic exploration in this uh, policy parameterization, immediately uh, it will crash. It will not work, right? But if you're a bit more careful and more cautiously explore, then um, uh, the, you can actually find better solutions. So here really the quadcopter fully autonomously experiments with its own control parameters in order to sort of try to uh, improve on, uh, on what it can do. And uh, in just a moment, there's sort of a little comparison uh, of the initial and final controllers. <coughs> okay, so uh, that's sort of one, arguably a little bit stylized experiment. There's some other interesting uh, directions I wanted to tell you about in applications. So one original motivation 
that caused us to think about this sort of safe exploration was actually a medical application. So this is in collaboration with Joel Burdick's group at Caltech um, and Jan and uh, uh, Sui's PhD thesis, he's also co-author in the Safe Up paper. Um, so where they looked at a problem in medical rehabilitation, so they worked with spinal cord injured patients, and uh, what uh, was found in previous work is that by implanting them, uh, electrode arrays that you can see on this x-ray image, some of the patients that um, uh, prior to that had no control of their lower limbs anymore, they're actually able to voluntarily stand up, take uh, steps, and so on. And of course, one of the central issues with this application is that every patient is different, and we don't have a good simulator of a patient. It means that these experiments actually have to be done in the context of the clinical trial. All right? And so uh, what, this is, this is sort of the starting point, right? And of course you sort of can only do, have to be extremely careful with what you do, right? But eventually sort of they push this all the way to clinical trials. So in this paper here, um, they show basically a variant of this algorithm that I've described, really deployed in context of clinical trials and comparing with sort of stimuli that an expert physician would uh, provide. We've also been doing some work on using these ideas uh, to do other things like, for example, uh, tuning uh, control systems for uh, building uh, heating management. So we, uh, we uh, there's this remark yesterday, right, that sort of most of the controllers out there, I think 95% was the number quoted, um, are PID controllers, right? So effectively there's three numbers or two that need to be specified. Uh, but of course, how you tune them very has a strong, strong effect on the kind of performance you can get. And so one sort of natural application of this sort of machinery is to use the safe optimization to learn to tune these different parameters. And so there's some experiments in this paper that, uh, that discuss this sort of thing. So coming back to the laser, uh, so two of my students actually went ahead and deployed the algorithm on the machine. And this is sort of online tuning a few tens of parameters. So these are some experiments on the 24 dimensional uh, parameter space. So what they would do is they would first ask the uh, physicists to come up with a parameter setting that they would normally do to operate the machine. Then they would sort of aggressively detune it to perform badly. And then they would use different algorithms in order to try to recover. And so one standard benchmark that's used is sort of, uh, uh, sort of local search techniques based on uh, the nel meet algorithm. And that sometimes does get stuck in poor solutions and so on, right? And also has, doesn't have any safety guarantees in this context. Uh, this is uh, this variant of, uh, of SafeUp that I've uh, described actually does find better solutions pretty consistently uh, over a range of experiments, oftentimes even better than the initial exper expert settings that were found. Okay, so this is some uh, work I wanted to talk about uh, in the context of safe exploration. So I also want to talk a little bit about sort of efficiency of exploration. Um, and maybe as a segue to this, right, is we talk about optimism as one of sort of the central principles in exploration in reinforcement learning, right? Be optimistic and good things will happen, hopefully. Uh, so you see that I mean, sometimes this fails, right? So safety is sort of one reason. There's also beautiful work by Chaba and uh, Tolatimor and sort of thinking about the limitations of, uh, of optimism and so on. I want to make a point that's sort of related but maybe slightly more general. So essentially, if you think about all, essentially all the standard exploration techniques that are used in bandits, in uh, reinforcement learning and so on, they basically rely on this idea of giving uncertainty bonuses. Right? So everything else being equal, I'm going to prefer the action that I'm mo more uncertain about. Right? So UCB makes this very explicit. You take the mean plus the multiple times the standard deviation in your prediction. Right? You linearly scalarize these two quantities. But if you think about things like epsilon greedy, Combase exploration, Thompson sampling, and so on, so you always prefer things that you haven't tried as often, things you're uncertain about, and so on. But uncertainty is not the same as informativeness. And here's sort of a little cartoon uh, grounding this in this electron laser application. Uh, so imagine that there's two different parameter settings for the beam, um, A and B, and two different detectors we can use, one and two. One is very, has very little noise, it's very accurate, and two is very, very noisy. Okay? So we want to figure out what's the best, better one. So there's four choices we have, right? We can pick mode A or B with detector one and two. So we have four actions in this cartoon, right? Now, of course, the performance is the same no matter whether we use any of these two detectors, right? So we know that these two parameters will be the same, right? However, if we carry out experiments, one of them will be a lot more noisy than the other. 
OK, so now if you sort of construct confidence estimates on that parameter, of course they're the same. If you know how much noise you have, maybe you can use tighter estimators, right? But in the end, the confidence estimates will be the same. So it means that optimistic exploration has no incentive to, prepare, pr to prefer somehow the low noise detector, right, with the high, uh, compared to the high noise detector, right? And arguably, if you can choose between those two, you pick the first one. Okay, yeah? What if you use something like tempering a bench thing or something like that? Estimate the variance of the sample? Yeah, so what you can do is you can certainly estimate the variance of the sample and use it in order to construct tighter estimators. Yeah. That doesn't change the expiration strategy. It doesn't. It does not, right? So it still doesn't resolve this question. The confident thing that was would be different, so you would have to change the variance. They'd be still be the same for those two because from prior knowledge, you know they're the same, right? You can integrate information from these two different actions. And that's what you yeah. Right? Yeah. So but you can talk more later if, right, to make this more precise. But that's basically the point. OK, good. OK, and so this happens, right? This is the laser, right? So there's massive differences in the amount of noise, right, in certain parts of the parameter space, and very consistently so. And arguably, right here, you don't need many measurements to figure out that this is really a bad setting. This is here, maybe you need a lot of measurements to tell whether this is better than this. OK. So one way to sort of get at this is to more carefully think about informativeness by borrowing ideas from optimal experimental design. And this building is some beautiful prior work by Daniel Rousseau and Ben van Roy on a criterion called information-directed sampling. So the way it works is as follows. So we, instead of being optimistic, we're going to minimize this ratio here. So what's the numerator? It's basically a bound on the suboptimality of action X, experiment X. And we're going to divide this by some notion of informativeness of our action. So we're going to use some information measure to quantify how many bits of information we're going to get by carrying out experiment X. Right? So you prefer to have good values, a little suboptimality. At the same time, you want to have um, uh, large informativeness. Right? And so just to be concrete about this information measure, so one way to do this is to literally count bits. Right? So take Shannon's mutual information and look at how many bits we get from that experiment. And that naturally, uh, sort of some signal to noise ratio pops up. But the numerator now is the epistemic uncertainty. So, what's our uncertainty due to having carried out too little experiments so far? And the denominator is the aleatoric uncertainty, so the intrinsic noise in the experiment. Right? And so, this is sort of where this shows up. OK? So, why this is ratio? So, here's sort of a one line proof. Uh, it's actually kind of cute. So, so, basically, if you just think about bounding and regret of the algorithm, right, you just get the sum of the suboptimalities. You can multiply and divide by the square root of that information measure, uh, apply Cauchy Schwartz, and here is this information ratio. And what's left is just the sum of these bits. And that's exactly that same quantity we talked about before, right? This information capacity. How many bits I can, at worst case, extract from my prior? And that we understand very well for these kinds of models. Right? And so now that very naturally suggests sort of just minimizing this term. And that's what exactly what IDS does. And that's how you can get sort of a regret bound for ideas and variance. Yeah? It also suggests that you could come up with many different other ratios. Yes. Right? So other ratios, exactly. And so in particular, other kinds of information measures, right? And so what we explore in this paper, so, right, there's sort of one way to think about those. Of course, you can attribute things to the numerator and denominator, right? But, uh, but sort of really what this, one way to interpret this is sort of use this in different information measures. So instead of thinking about bits about f, I can think about bits about, say, the optimal value of f or the, sol uh, the, the uh, optimal solution uh, of f, right? And these kind of ideas have been heuristically explored in the context of Bayesian optimization quite a bit. And that's sort of a way of making this more formal, OK? And so uh, now you can construct these gap estimates again from this sort of picture, right? If this is our optimistic estimate on the optimum, I have actions x1 and x2. Right? I, uh, this is my gap estimate. Right? I look at the pessimistic estimate for these actions compared to an optimistic estimate of f, and that's it. Okay, and so that very naturally it's an algorithm. So you can think about it in the homoscedastic setting, that's just the homoscedastic linear bandit, um, where the actions have an equal amount of noise across actions, and there the algorithm basically does the same as UCB. Right? So here uncertainty really is informativeness, because the noise is the same, this rate information ratio is the same. But if you think about heteroscedastic bandits, where there is dependence on the action, there's a huge difference. And there's actually two major improvements. So the first one is by just using better estimators, like Chaba suggested, right, and sort of other things. So maybe you can use better likelihood functions and so on. 
but there's still a huge gap compared to what you can do if you do better exploration. So this is the gap by using different estimators, this is the gap by using better exploration strategies. Okay, and so th these are simulations, but you can do these things uh, more broadly in terms of hesoskedasticity is really prevalent in sort of numerous different domains, not just this electron laser, right? So there's many different domains, right? So in particular, in RL, it's really a ubiquitous phenomenon. There's various different sources, like hetoscedastic rewards, transition models, um, even aliasing, sort of treating observations as state can lead to these sort of effects, right? Artifacts due to the way we train, say, uh, uh, Q functions with neural nets and so on. And so what we've been looking at is to basically sort of heuristically use this algorithm, which we can analyze theoretically for GPs, uh, but apply them to deep reinforcement learning. And so now, of course, we sort of do need a Bayesian model for things like the Q function. And of course, there's been a lot of, uh, of really nice prior work in sort of trying to make that happen, right? So uh, this is sort of the standard TQN architecture for playing Atari, there's these convolutional layers, and then there's fully connected layers that predict the Q value. And so what you can do is you can sort of make these models Bayesian by sort of trying to capture uh, uncertainty in the models themselves, is to use different heads in this model, and uh, by assembling them, right, from different initial conditions and so on. And so now here these different heads sort of predict structural uncertainty in these Q estimates. So this is sort of one uh, approach that's been proposed in prior work that actually works empirically pretty well. Uh, and that gives big improvements, and this is sort of prior work. And so one thing we've done is we just take this model and swap out the exploration strategy. Just plug in this sort of form of IDS, and actually gives pretty substantial improvements. And you can do more, you can also uh, uh, model a different likelihood function. So instead of a squared loss, Gaussian likelihood, you use some sort of estimates of the percentiles of the distribution, um, and then that gives better performance than not doing that. And again, right, by swapping out the exploration strategy, you can, again, uh, uh, pretty substantial gains. So this is on the speed of 51 uh, Atari games. And so what you really see empirically is that you sort of get pretty substantial acceleration in the learning. Okay, so in the remaining uh, two hours of my talk, <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, tell you very briefly about some directions combining ideas from sort of safety and robustness and efficiency. And it's the most important problem that we have here, namely uh, how to uh, quickly go to the beach, right? So the most natural thing in the world here after workshop is to head to Santa Monica, right? And try to uh, go to the beach. And so uh, now, of course, there's different ways of how we could do that, different paths, right? And maybe you get sort of some predictions on how long this might take. But eventually, we really have to do the experiment. We actually have to drive there and figure out how long did it take us. The problem is we are not the only ones who want to go to Santa Monica. Right? All of LA wants to go to Santa Monica. Right? And so if we de right, uh, decide to take a, ro a route, then we're congesting it, and others will have uh, to take longer time. Okay? So you can think about this problem of sort of learning to quickly drive to Santa Monica as sort of an online learning problem. That's sort of a classical way to think about these kind of problems, where every day we decide how to go to Santa Monica, and then we get some reward, how quickly it took us to get there, maybe a negative cost. But of course, that does depend on our action, and depends on what everyone else did, right? The, the, all the other actions. Okay, and so one natural notion of objective you might think about is the regret, so which is uh, this external regret, comparing what we got, how long it took us over the course of the workshop, say, compared to the best we could have gotten in hindsight. Okay, now there's a rich literature on regret minimization and how to uh, play these sort of games. And how well we do depends on the feedback, depends on what we kind of uh, can observe. Okay, and so in particular, there's what's called the banded feedback model, right? That's what, right, maybe is most natural in this sort of setting. So once we drove to Santa Monica, we know how long it took us. Okay, so that's pretty realistic. However, um, the dependence on the number of different routes, decisions we could take, it's actually pretty poor. So if there's lots of different choices we could do, uh, then this actually will take a long time. And this is to be contrasted with what's called the full information setting, which basically asks that we can counterfactually evaluate how long it would have taken us had we taken a different route. All right? So we get to see the entire vector of rewards for different actions we could have taken today. Okay? And so it turns out that buys an exponential improvement in terms of the number of choices. So you go from square root k to log k. 
pretty substantial for large K. Okay, so the problem is that oftentimes this kind of feedback model is unrealistic. It's very hard to say in hindsight how long did it would have had would have would it have taken us had we taken a different route. Okay? And so what we look at in this work is something that's sort of in between. It's almost the banded model with just a bit of additional information. In particular, what you assume is not only how long it took us to get there, but also so the information on what actions the other players took in hindsight. Turns out it's actually enough to just have some sort of aggregate information about this. And that's arguably realistic and sort of more realistic in many different settings. And turns out that under this additional assumptions, one can, at least in many cases, still get this exponential improvement in terms of the number of actions. One can still basically get full information rates at sort of almost banded feedback. And what the conditions we need are basically the ones that I've been telling you all through this talk, right? To basically assume that this payoff function as a function, right, of what we took and what all the other players did is sort of smooth, right, satisfies, right, has some small norm in this RKHS associated with uh, some sort of model that you're going. And the algorithm is basically, should be pretty natural now, so all we do is we basically build this probabilistic model to build these confidence bounds on this counterfactual feedback. And then we play a full information algorithm on these hallucinated outcomes. Okay, so basically what you're going to do is we don't have this full information feedback. We don't know how long it would have taken us had we taken a different route, but we predict it. Right? We just predict it from our model of this payoff function. In particular, we predict it optimistically. And turns out that's enough because these confidence bounds contract sort of quickly enough that uh, one still sort of get this fast rate um, at this much, much uh, less stringent feedback. And it also pretty, uh, works pretty well. So here, these are sort of very few number of trials, sort of a few tens of trials. There's the full information model. So this is a, a, a sort of standard benchmark setting in traffic routing um, and simulations on this. So here's the full information setting. That's, of course, this idealistic, somewhat unrealistic benchmark. Uh, there's the adversarial banded setting that doesn't make use of this structure, right? Uh, that's substantially worse, so there's a huge gap in between. There's also some forms of Q-learning that have been designed for these kinds of games. Um, and so here again, this is a very, very small number of trials, so you don't really get to anywhere close to convergence. And here, by actually using these models and predicting the outcome, uh, you can at least substantially close the gap to this ideal uh, feedback. And also, if you now have multiple agents that sort of implement this learning algorithm, you can ask if I use more and more agents that sort of try to selfishly optimize according to the model that they use, what happens with the overall network. And it turns out that if you use poor algorithms, the overall congestion can actually increase, so bad things can happen for the network. But um, using these better algorithms, actually the overall congestion uh, decreases for the network. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to talk about. I think there's a lot of really interesting problems where we're just sort of scratching the surface and sort of trying to take ideas from data-driven control and reinforcement learning to real applications. Lots of interesting problems. Many of them have been touched here, how to more rigorously think about partial observability, uh, adversarial perturbations, distribution shifts, and so on. So one direction I think that's certainly crucial for this line of work is where does this prior come from? And so one direction that I've been very excited to explore is sort of use ideas from meta-learning in order to sort of learn good priors from related tasks. So here's a recent paper we just put on archive that basically um, uses data from related tasks, uh, like previous experiments on the Swiss cell laser, in order to learn good covariance functions and mean functions, maybe parameterized by a neural network, by minimizing uh, a packed Bayesian generalization bound. And it actually works really well compared to sort of standard uh, meta-learning approaches like MAML or um, neural processes sort of on the more Bayesian front, uh, both in terms of the RMSE, but also in terms of model calibration. And that is arguably the most important th thing if you want to think about, uh, if you think about uh, exploration using these techniques for, uh, for things like uh, safety and so on. Okay, so that's it. I'd like to close by just thanking all the students who did this, um, uh, 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 all this work and the uh, senior collaborators. It was really fun to collaborate with all of them. Thank you very much.